Hi, I'm Alice Woods, Erlon's mom. The following episode of Ear Hustle contains language and content that may not be appropriate for all listeners. Discretion is advised. So, hey, how you doing? I'm good. I'm good now. We're gonna get to sit next to each other in the car. And do the yeah. Are you hungry? Am I hungry? I was, but I'm. Oh, hold on. This is. This is. See, yeah. This, this is, is crazy, what we right? don't get to see. Yeah. Woo. Indeed. That's a damn good view. All righty. All right. You ready to see time. something get small in the Yeah. Here. Yeah. I'm ready to see it get small. But that's a damn good view, though. Mm -hmm. Woo. This is interesting. Yeah, let's put a seatbelt on too. Okay, all right. I gotta put the seatbelt on? Yeah. I say I was gonna watch yeah. the place get little, but I ain't even turning around. <laughs> oh, yeah. My favorite word today, I think that's always my very interesting. It, it's a very interesting. Interesting, very interesting. Very interesting. You know what's interesting? Do I? Yeah. Like it's the, the prison clothes. The prison clothes are really unflattering. You look so, um, anyway, you well, look Well, I'm still about 2.30. <laughs> A good 2.30. Okay, first call to moms. Let's see. Do, 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 do. Yeah, 9 Oh, no, sorry. No, no, you got to do one first. Hey, what's up, mama? This is your son. Hi, are you out? I am rolling across the bridge right now. <laughs> I think you just broke the phone. Oh, mm -hmm. shit. Oh man, what's happening, man? <laughs> how does it feel to get out that car? How does it, man? How does it feel to go from being locked up to being out here, man? It feels great, man. You know, it's, it's, of course, it's, it's bittersweet, you know, um, leaving bro behind, you know, and a lot of good dudes that's um, locked up that I think should be out. You know, I'm, I mean, I'm, of course, I'm happy for self, you know, um, but um, it's bittersweet, man. It's interesting. You're now tuned in to San Quentin's Ear Hustle from PRX's Radiotopia. I'm Erlon Woods, a former resident at San Quentin State Prison in California. And I'm Nigel Poor, a visual artist, now podcaster. I've been working with the men at San Quentin for almost eight years now. And together, we're going to take you... Hmm. Where are we going to take them, Nigel? <laughs> Outside and then back in. That's what's up. In this episode, we're going to hear about getting out and missing out. And there's a lot there to talk about. Indeed. Erlon, we are recording together for the very first time outside the walls of San Quentin. Yes, indeed. I'm back on the blacktop. <laughs> Where are we? Currently, we're in the Snap Judgment studio in Oakland, and it's a little quieter than that media center in San Quentin that we used to record in. I know. It's actually a little eerily quiet. The crazy thing, you know what I'm going to miss? What's that? Telling Lonnie to be quiet. <laughs> you mean you're going to miss being Lonnie? Too? I'm going to straight up miss that shit. Yeah, I understand. It was our interaction, you know? Absolutely. Lonnie, keep it down. <laughs> oh, my bad, bro. Oh, you sound just <laughs> like him. Oh, my God. Okay, it is true. We have very exciting news. After 21 years, you are no longer incarcerated. Fuck no. <laughs> You've been decarcerated. Indubitably. As many listeners may already know, your sentence was commuted by the Honorable Governor Jerry Brown. Good looking out, Governor. <laughs> yeah, about a year ago, I submitted for a commutation of my sentence. Mm -hmm. And it took a while, but the governor signed off on it a few weeks ago, and I'm free as a bird. Free! <laughs> <laughs> free as a bird that got to check in with his parole officer from time to time. But hey, I'm cool with that. Yes. So, tell people where you're living. I'm living in the Bay Area. And thanks to the good folks from Restored Justice, I'm in a nice transitional house. And what's that like for you? It's love. It's peaceful. Mm. It's just sitting on the porch watching traffic go by. You know what's so cool? Uh. 
driving up and parking in front of your house and walking up the stairs and right. he's like knock 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 right. and you're like hey Nige what up Nige <laughs> that's yeah, actually that's, what you say that's 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 what's up oh man it's such a huge change and like what are you thinking what are you feeling and most importantly you know mm. I have to know about what you're eating <laughs> Well, hey, you was at my first meal. <laughs> That's right. We stopped at a diner. And I had to have what I've been thinking about for years. Oh, a special order. Steak and eggs. Graphics mm-hmm. of the champions. <laughs> with toast. With toast. With a lemon or an orange. Hey, man. It tastes like... Um, Someone sacrificed himself for me. <laughs> Just for this day. No, it's cool, man. It's all right, man. It's good. Erlon, you were in prison for a long time. Yep. And now you have the chance to do and experience and eat many of the things you've been missing out on. Yeah, I got a hella long list. Oh, I bet you do. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, it's places I want to go, yeah. things I want to see, shit I want to do. But I think one of the things that I missed out on the most was the freedom of choice. What do you mean? Well, like today, for example, I had the freedom to make the choice to take a bath this morning. Oh, a glorious bath. Epsom salt and all. Oh, wow. How long did you spend in there? <laughs> bubble bath. Straight up bubble bath. Were you there long enough that you I, had to add hot water? I, I was in there long enough till I got out wrinkled. <laughs> That's how long I was in there. I got oh, out wrinkled. What a great feeling. Beautiful feeling. Okay. So bubble baths were just one of those little things you were missing out on. <laughs> but E, while you were getting ready to leave, we asked our colleague, Rasan Thomas. A.K.A. New York. Mm-hmm, to find out what guys inside are actively missing out on. Interesting. PlayStation 2. The donut shop. That was when that Street Fighter arcade game was real popular, man. So we go there and we get some donuts, we get some ice cream, and we'll play that Street Fighter game all day long. I really miss that. They got, they got a dish called Ban Chao. It's, it's, uh, it's like a crate, right? But it's a, it's a Cambodian crate kind of thing where they put uh, ground beef in there, uh, uh, ground beef with some seasonings and um, bean sprout. And she makes this peanut dip that just, it goes, it goes good together. And I miss that. That's my favorite meal. Just if you just think about music, stuff I've missed out on, you know. Before I got locked up, Taylor Swift wasn't even around. And just watching her go from a little kid to a huge star, all while I've been locked up, I mean, that's a concert I'd probably go to several times. And you can put this on record. Taylor Swift, she's the greatest songwriter in the universe today. I had a 83... Cadillac Barrettes, El Dorado, and uh, it had a gang of bullet holes in there, but it, it, it was my favorite car. I really miss just waking up in my own bed. You know, I miss the pillow, the sheets. You know, I, I, I miss the sound of kids running around in the feet tapping on the ground while I'm asleep. I just miss the opportunity to yell at somebody. <laughs> <laughs> So those are some of the little things. But the big thing, and Bonnaroo was hinting at that when he talked about the noise of children, the big thing is family. Huge. What guys are mostly missing out on are their wives. Their kids, their mom. Yeah, family. You got to see your mom recently in L.A. Yes, I did. I snuck up on her. (laughs) (laughs) She must have yelped. Ah, man, you know, it was good seeing her. It was like real profound like I can't even explain it I can't express it just seeing her face oh it was really sweet that you got to spend time with your family but there was someone who was missing yeah my big brother Trevor Mm -hmm. he's still inside he had transferred into San Quentin about a year and a half ago and we sailed up together I'm gonna miss him yeah and I got to talk to him right before you left he said you were a great celly, gone a.m. to p.m. <laughs> but he said it's bittersweet that you are on your way out. I don't have to worry about him now. Meaning, let's just say if I got into something, 
he's gone. You know, I don't want to have to my, you know, stumble or something, pull him into a situation. Because, you know, anything can happen in this, in this type of environment. So I'm glad that he's gone, you know, and he don't have to deal with that. Your brother's done 14 years of a 36-year sentence. Right. So he's been missing out on quite a bit over the years. And that's what we're going to focus on now. Yep, my brother has a difficult story to tell about missing out. It's a story about his son, Tyler. My nephew, who was born in 1994. Now listen close, because we have a name soup here. Trevor is my brother. Tyler is his son. And don't forget Tyra. And Tyra, the mother of my nephew. Oh, wow, that's the best part of my life, becoming a mom. Um, Because he was just a dream come true. He's the most beautiful child you ever would see, and... And when he was born, he was just staring, looking at me, and he had eye contact the whole time. He knew exactly who I was. When Tyler was born, Trevor was living a life of crime, but he was still very involved with Tyler and with his kids from other relationships. I was a father. I was the father. You know, um, if you are... Let me reframe that. How are you as a father? Well, I'm a great father. You know, I was the type of father that my father wasn't to me. How about that? What do you mean by that? I mean, um, I spent the majority of the time when I wasn't in the streets with my kids. You know, they were with me at all times, pretty much. Took them to baseball games, basketball games, practices, banquets. I was a father. School clothed them, fed them, everything. As Tyler got older, his family life got more complicated. His parents separated, and his father was wanted by law enforcement. I had um, the feds, the Fugitive Task Force, the marshals, the bail bonds service, the bail bonds insurance people. Once the bail bondsmen can't catch you, now the insurance people got to catch you. I had the sheriffs. Uh, yeah, about five different agencies. It was serious. I, did, I I played with it at first. You know, I didn't think it was that serious until I, until they almost had me a couple of times. They almost had me dropping Tyler off at school. One morning, in front of Tyler's school, Trevor saw a blue van parked in what looked like a stakeout. So I said, Tyler, can you hop the gate? Yeah, Daddy, I can hop the gate. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, so, so... We bust a U, and I said, you know what? I'm not going to let my baby hop over no gate. So I bust a U, drove back by the van, pulled halfway in the the front driveway, gave him a kiss. I said, look, man, these people, they're going to come up here. I said, and you don't tell them nothing. You call your grandma, you call your granddaddy, you know, and and this, that, and the other. He said, okay, daddy. I said, I love you. Kissed him. He got out with his backpack. So I watched him walk into the school. And when Trevor pulled away, the van was on him. They were coming hard. I said, here they come. But they were some cars back trying to get to me. So when I pulled back and made that right, yeah, it was over. I'm gone. I, 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 I went all the way back to a friend house where I was staying, and no sooner than I dropped her car off and somebody came and picked me up, SWAT ran up in her house. While Trevor was on the run, he and Tyra were involved in a crime together. Trevor got away, but Tyra didn't. She was arrested for kidnap robbery and sentenced to 17 years. So with Tyra behind bars, Trevor was left to explain the situation to young Tyler. And you asked him about it, E. Right. How did you tell Tyler that his mom was in jail? Man, listen, that was... That was one of, the, one of the hardest things to do in my life because he was an innocent child. I had to try to figure out how to give him this blow. I couldn't just give him the blow at one time. I had to keep him, you know, thinking in a positive state. So I didn't tell him right away. I just said this and said that, you know, she'll be this, she'll be that, it's, you know. He was like, well, what does she do, Dad? And I'm like, man, uh, you know, I'm I'm trying to be, I'm trying to make up stuff. 
And uh, he was with <clears throat> my older son and his mom at the time. And uh, I eventually told a man, and I'm going to tell you, I told him his mother was in jail, man, and my little boy broke down. We all broke down. Just looking at his hurt and his anguish, I cried. My older son cried. His mama cried. It was it was terrible, man. It was it was terrible. It was terrible. He was, what she do, Dad? What she? You know, it was. I can't. I don't even like reliving that, man. I mean, that's just real. Um, <clears throat> the first visit, yeah, was through the glass, but, um, and he kept touching the glass. Tyra remembers the first time that Tyler came to visit her in jail. He was about eight years old. And, um, it was just, um. I felt like my heart was separate from my body. I, I couldn't hold him. And, uh, he just kept touching the glass and I put my hand to the glass. It was like, you know, you see it on movies but you don't feel it until it really happens to you and it's, it's really hard. So eventually, I get arrested. Once again, I don't want to tell them. Fourth of July is coming up. We have big Fourth of July events. So he talking about Fourth of July, man, and I just hear it in his voice. So I'm like, man, I can't. How can I tell him? You know, I was his last hope. You know, I was his last. You know, his everything. So how can I tell him this? And I drug, I dragged it out just like I did with his mama until finally I had to tell him. Once again, he broke down. He said, I feel like I'm out here by myself. And, you know, that tore my soul, that, that uh, <clears throat> knocked me back, man, you know. So he, he 10 at this time. Probably so, yeah. He ten, so he he lost his mom and his dad. Yeah, we let him down, man. So Trevor and Tyra each began serving long prison terms. And because of that, my nephew went to live with our extended family. We're going to hear more from Trevor and Tyra and their efforts to stay connected to their son. But let's hear a different story now about another guy who was also separated from his family due to prison. Out of nowhere, I get this mail, and I look at the return address, and it says Monique on it. I said, oh, my God. My daughter, I haven't heard from in 20 years. Jasper is a familiar voice on the podcast. He was in the bird baths and a lockbox episode talking about his Sally. And if you've heard some jazz guitar in the podcast, that was probably him. First of all, I just took in her handwriting without ever opening this thing. I just sat there with the letter, and it was like I was sitting with her. I opened it up. I didn't know what to expect. And this card was in it, and it says, It's a prince. And this is a baby shower invitation. The due date is my birthday. And it's got my granddaughter's name on it next to this boy named Anthony. <laughs> Congratulations, Anthony. Never met you. This is how Jaspar found out that his granddaughter was married and that he was about to become a great-grandfather. But, uh, yeah, I called my brother and I said, did you know about this? <laughs> and, of course, everybody knows about everything before I do. All right? I'm the last guy to find out. 
And I complained and I whined and I said, you know, complained like I usually do about no one ever writes me and they go on with their lives. And, uh, and he reminded me that the world is not like that anymore. People don't use mail anymore. It's just that you have no presence, uh, no, what do they call that, digital footprint. There's no way that Jazz Bar could go to the baby shower, but he had an idea of how he could be a part of it. Like he said, he hadn't heard from his daughter in 20 years, and he didn't want to miss out. He planned to call the day of the shower. First thing I'm going to say, hi, it's your dad. Hi, it's your grandpa. Hi, who is this? <laughs> I don't know who would answer, you know. The day of the baby shower finally came, and that's what he did, he called. So I've got all these phone numbers, and I called my brother. His phone didn't answer. I went, okay. So I tried his, him at home in case he, you know, was there. Didn't get an answer there either. So I said, okay, here's the big number. And I'm going to call Monique, and I called her number. And uh, she didn't answer either. I went, oh, okay. Hmm. And I called about five different numbers, and nobody answered their phones. I kept getting voicemail and stuff like that. I said, oh, okay, let's go back to the top and try this again. So I did it again, and I went through the list again, and I called every number. No answer. So now I've already spent 10 minutes of my phone time calling numbers. So that was pretty much it. I was kind of relieved that no one picked up the phone. I went, oh, okay, that's, that's kind of better right now. I'll, call, I'll try again later. Can you talk about that a little bit more, being relieved that nobody answered? Because like, I'm hearing it, and I'm like gutted that nobody answered, but you're relieved. For me, it's like I'm still nervous about making those phone calls. You know, I'm, st I'm still anticipating having a conversation with her that I haven't had for 20 years, you know. And I've never been an intrusive type of person. You know, I support, but, you know, I'm not always pushing my way into their business because that's what prison creates is a situation where I'm here, they're there, and I'm not part of their life physically. But it's been 20 years since you spoke to your daughter. Mm -hmm. How many more years do you think it'll be? <laughs> well, you know, it's one of, the, one of the phone numbers I don't have is God's. It's not like Jasper doesn't want to reconnect. Remember that baby shower invitation he got in the mail? I have a, a special place where I keep stuff that, I, that, that is preserved in plastic and no one ever touches and, and I never take it out and it just stays in there and I know it's there and it's protected. And that's where that envelope is. We'll be back after the break. It's really hard to maintain relationships in prison, isn't it? It is, and it's deeply frustrating, especially for parents trying to be a part of their kids' lives. And that's what Tyra and Trevor quickly discovered. Let's get back to their story. They were both in prison, Tyra is in a state facility, and Trevor's doing federal time. Meanwhile, their young son, Tyler, was being raised by relatives. It was a lot of issues um, in prison because trying to parent when you have other people raising your children is the way I do things is not the way they do things. You have an ego because you're a parent. So in your, in your heart of hearts, that's my child. I call the shots. I run this. I do this, blah, blah, blah. But when you, when you come to jail, you still may not realize it, but all that shit is out the window because you are no longer the parent. You are the parent in words and in what it is, but somebody else is raising your child. He was being raised by his grandmother, and, you know, what she said goes. 
And pretty much what I said was, you can't be outside after six o'clock. You know, well, my grandmother says I can. It was an issue. It's hard because I just believe that parents are supposed to be there all the time. When my son's outside, I'm outside. You know, um, he's not around the corner where I can't see him. You may not like it. You may not like what they're saying, but they are the ones dealing with the child. Do you do you recall the first time that um, you were able to hug him when you got to prison? Oh yeah, I do. <laughs> I didn't stop hugging him. He just ran to me as soon as he saw me come out. He was waiting. He just ran and he grabbed me and he just hugged me and we just hugged for like it seemed like like hours. It was the best and the worst time because he wouldn't leave and then the guards were getting kind of like snappy and I got angry because. He's a baby. <laughs> I remember this so well because I was so angry at them because my son hadn't seen me. He wouldn't let me go. He was the last one in the room. He kept running back. He said, no, mommy, please. I want to stay with you. Can I just come in here with you? And I said, no, you can't. He said, I just want to be in here with you. What can I do? I just want to be... Here, please leave me here. It's literally impossible to be a parent while incarcerated because all you could do is talk and they know you can't get at them. So now they could say something fly, <laughs> you know, you know, because I can't do nothing. I'm hit. So what can I do? I can't chastise them. I can't, all I could do is, and then, you know, my fear of words, I used to have fear in my kids, you know. I never really whooped them anything like that, but I used to just talk tough. But my tough talk used to work. <laughs> it used to work. <laughs> As they got older, it, that, didn't, that fell by the side. It didn't work anymore. What did I miss out having to, uh, as far as having to parent? Yes. In prison? <laughs> Um, well, I missed out on so many things. I missed parent t-shirt conferences. I missed, um, I missed everything. It's graduations and, you know, just talking to them about girls and just everything. It's devastating because now Tyler, Tyler had a vision of his parents, his vision of his father. You know, he didn't know nothing about the game. He didn't know nothing about what was going on, but he thought he did. So when you're gone, they have to try to grow up on their own. You know, and the mothers can't do too much. My mother, my mother was grandmother. You know, she couldn't do too much. You know, so Tyler was out there trying to grow up on his own, trying to be something that he didn't know nothing about. And he began acting out. And uh, it was just, I just seen him slipping through my fingers because I wasn't there to snatch him up. You know, he was ripping and running with the gangs. You know, he was, um, you know, I, I, I'm talking to him all the time. So even though I'm hearing stuff and then I'm talking to him, he, he playing it, he downplaying it. So I'm not thinking that it's serious as much as I'm hearing. You know, he running the streets, he running with these hard heads, you know, they playing with guns or whatever have you. And I'm like, I'm telling my son, son, look, don't be, whatever you do, don't play with no guns. Don't be out there doing no robberies, none of that stuff. That stuff carries 17 years. I told him that constantly. Oh, daddy, I'm not playing with no guns. I'm not doing this, I'm not doing that. I'm not doing this, I'm not doing that. On November 19th, 2013. On the 19th, November 19th, 2013, federal prison, we have phones and we have emails. I used to work for the captain at CIW in the program office. I was a clerk. And um, the captain comes in. He says, um, I need to speak with you. I received an email from one of my partners. And he said, Tyler got killed by the police. They told me that my son was murdered, well, killed. 
and I hit the floor. I sat there and I stared at it, and I'm, I'm and I'm like, this can't be. I, I pushed my chair back from the from the. I never forget it. I pushed my chair back from the from the table, and um, I stared at it. All kind of thoughts of this couldn't be true. This got to be some bullshit. Then I stood up and I just, I, I, I just, I got, I got. I got amped up, I got hyped, you know, I, I started jumping around and I'm, I couldn't breathe and I, and I just. I, I just lost it. I think I went to the council office, you know, I had, in the feds you get 300 minutes to talk. I had already used up my phone time. Matter of fact, I used up my phone time talking to Tyler. You know, and and I and the cold part about that was, in our last conversation, my time was running out, and he said, "Daddy, when you gonna call me back?" That's the last words I heard of him. When you gonna call me back? So when I heard that he died, that's all that sat on my mind. Last, those are the last words I heard him say, "Daddy, when you gonna call me back?" Tyler was killed by police in Long Beach, California. It didn't become a national story like Michael Brown or Laquan McDonald, but if you lived in Southern California, you probably heard about it. It's a complicated story, and we're not going to get too deeply into it on the podcast, but here's the basics. Tyler had jumped bail after being arrested. He and a girlfriend got pulled over by the police, and I'm going to let my brother take it from here. They question everybody, and they questioning Tyler, talking about where you from. He said, I'm not from nowhere. So then they asked him to get out the car. He get out the car. They, he give him my oldest son name, his brother's name. It didn't match up. You know, he don't want to go to jail. He take off running. He has no weapon. You know, he's, he's running. They through. searched him, didn't they? Yeah, they searched him. They searched him on the spot. They did pat him down. He has no weapon. I think he had on some shorts or something. You know, you can't have no weapon and no and no loose shorts uh, anyway. So he running. They track him down, I hear, corner him in some apartment, and, and, they, and they shoot at him, you know, several, 40 sometimes, 30, 40 times, they say. Hit him 19 times. It's a story we've been hearing a lot in recent years. None of the police officers who shot Tyler were charged. But there was a civil case, and a jury awarded a settlement for violating Tyler's civil rights. At the time, for Trevor and Tyra, it was a situation that happens often in prison. A family member dies, and that becomes yet another way you're missing out. I couldn't go to the funeral. You know, I was already in there. You know, I was... um, in the mental health program for just, you know, sleeping issues. You know, I have sleeping issues, you know, my mind roams sometime. And so I, I, I went down there a few times and, and um, I just tried to, matter of fact, I told the people to put me in the hole because I didn't want to be around or deal with nobody. So I said, man, y'all need to put me in the shoe. And uh, they was like, oh man, we can't do that, man. You need to be around somebody, you know what I mean? So this, is, this was their point of view. Because I just didn't want to be around, you know. I wanted to sit and um, just try to process this the best way I could. Everybody just seemed like everybody just found out in the prison that people that didn't even know me. And they came and they brought me flowers. They brought me cards and letters and. They just, they just came from nowhere. I didn't even know these people. Um, and they just made sure that I was, I had to stay alive because I didn't want to stay alive. I just told my captain, I said, I can't, I can't guarantee you that you're going to see me tomorrow. I'm done. I can't. It's too hard. And he said, you have to. Um, 
like I said, the, I have great staff that really, really care. They care. And the people that I didn't even know, they just came and they, they helped me. The staff was good all through the whole prison. I could say that. They were great. I mean, you what can you do but blame yourself? Yeah, fuck the police and all of that shit, but I'm I got to, you know, I'm guilty. You know, I'm I let him down, you know, I let him down in, in more than one way. And when you 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 sit back and you think about what your child is going through mentally through all of this, it's devastating. It's devastating. Because I put him in that position, I put him in that predicament, I put him in that, I put him in that situation to be grown before his time. Was there any way to process that? No, 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 no. That, that was it for me. That was when I really just tried to kill myself. Like, God, I didn't want to be there no more. Because all the nice stuff, it was great, but I can't see my son. <laughs> and they told me my security level was high. They came with all these, but I hadn't had a write-up in like 12 years. You won't let me see my son. <laughs> I work for you. I do everything. I do everything I'm supposed to do. And you won't let me see my son. I was angry. Since the system didn't allow you to do anything, how did you memorialize Tyler? I didn't. I couldn't. I couldn't do it. Not yet? No. We spoke with Tyra on November 19th, 2018, the five-year anniversary of Tyler's death. And Erlon, it is clear this is really painful for her. Absolutely. You know, my family has been stripped of Tyler's love, and there's nothing that can replace that. And as for things getting better, she's dealing with it. After serving more than 15 years, Tyra was released from prison in 2017. She's now living in Southern California, where we reached her by phone. Nai, will you please come here? They want to talk to you. <laughs> come here. Say hi to your grandfather and your Uncle Earl. What's up, peanut head? Hi, Uncle Earl. What's up, man? How you doing? Good. What's up, peanut head? What you doing over there? Um, let's go to the store. When you gonna come see me? When you gonna come see him? Next weekend. Oh, <laughs> what do you say? Next weekend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna try to get you, you down here. Just got to do some paperwork with your mom so we can get you down here to see your granddad. Okay. Okay. Oh God, he looks just like Tyler. You're gonna freak out when you see him, Trevor. Yeah. Erlon, this has been such a personal episode for you. First about you getting out, and then the ordeal that your family went through. Yeah, this was a big one. So, I want to thank Tyra and my big brother Trevor for sharing their stories and reliving that trauma that I know wasn't easy to talk about. And I want y'all to know that I appreciate y'all. Thank you to Lee Jaspar for talking to us about becoming a great grandfather. Congratulations. The Jaspar family expands. Oh, that's nice. Hey, E, people are wondering what's going to happen with Ear Hustle. Well, 
I have to say, is great getting out of prison with a job. Oh, yes, yes, yes. It takes away so much stress about how you're going to make it on the outside. Mm -hmm. That's like the biggest problem with reentry. And I'm delighted to say that I got a (laughs) J-O-B. Yes, you are now a full-time Radiotopia PRX employee working as a producer for Ear Hustle. Yep, I'll still be co-hosting with you, Nige. Thank God. But from the outside. <laughs> All right, fair enough. Talking about stories of re-entry from people like me, the formerly incarcerated. And on the inside. Oh boy, y'all in <laughs> for a ride. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but we do have a very special new host who listeners will meet in season four. And you're going to love them. Also next season, our plan is to visit other prisons and hear what they have to say. To give you a taste, here's a little tape from Pelican Bay in Northern California where guys are talking about what they've been missing out on. Uh, I've been incarcerated since 1988. I've been here, I started my time here back in 91, 92. I've been down going on eight years now. I'm serving uh, 15 years. And one of the things that I miss out on the most is uh, just hanging out with my family, man. Just just being out there, being a, a normal human being. Sitting across from my wife and eating dinner and just talking about anything. Yeah, my grandkids. I, I miss them dearly. Barbecues, family gatherings. And especially with our kids, having them there with us and walking that bike trail and stuff from Torrance uh, Beach to Redondo Beach. Mom's cooking. I mean, just just the simple things that I took for granted when I was out there. That, that's that's one of the things that I miss the most. You know what, E? What's up? It took a lot of people to make this conversation at Pelican Bay happen. Ooh. So we have a gang of names to mention. Thanks to Warden James Robertson, the Public Information Officer Lieutenant John Silveria, TV Specialist Tommy Rico, Community Resource Manager Robert Lasaco and Academic Advisor, Vice Principal, Kari Tilaro Rexford. Thanks for helping us build that bridge. We shall continue the conversation. And thanks to all the guys who spoke to us. Robert Grujeta, Jeffrey Ratchford, and Kip Bapule. Thanks for breaking the ice. Our team is growing inside and out. Watch the expansion. And you know what? What's that? You and me will always be partners. Partners from the start inside and partners now on the outside. Hell yeah, professional partners on the outside now. That's nice. Indeed. Your Hustle is produced by myself, Nigel Poor. And me, the free Erline Woods. With help from outside producer Pat Masidi Miller, who also works with our sound design team. This episode includes music from David Jossie, Antoine Williams, E. Phil Phillips, Greg Sayers, Eric Maserati E. Abercrombie, and Lee Jaspar. Curtis Fox is our story editor, Aaron Wade's our digital producer, and Julie Shapiro is our executive producer for Radiotopia. We want to thank Warden Ron Davis, and as you know, every episode has to be approved by this guy here. This is Lieutenant Sam Robinson at San Quentin State Prison, and it's definitely, it's definitely another special time in that Ear Hustle gets to grow, and um, we grow beyond the walls of San Quentin with Mr. Erlon Woods, who is no longer incarcerated here at the prison. And so as we move on to new areas and new adventures and Ear Hustle, I get the opportunity to say one last time this season, this is Lieutenant Sam Robinson at San Quentin State Prison, and I approve this story. Next time on Ear Hustle. Well, we don't know exactly. We're going to be taking a little break while we figure out our next step. But in the meantime, go to our website, earhustlesq.com, to sign up for our newsletter and stay in touch. We'll also have some audio treats up there for you real soon. Yes, and don't forget about Ear Hustle t-shirts and mugs. Matter of fact, I stepped out the gates of San Quentin wearing my one-of-a-kind all-black Ear Hustle tee. Damn, it felt nice. And it looked good, too. (laughs) See pictures on our website and be sure to follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Ear Hustle SQ. Ear Hustle is a proud member of Radiotopia from PRX, a collection of the best podcasts around. Hear more at radiotopia.fm. This podcast was made possible with support from the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, 
working to redesign the justice system by building power and opportunity for communities impacted by incarceration. Thanks to Snap Judgment for letting us record in their studio. I'm Erline Woods, the free dude. And I'm Nigel Poor. Thanks, Thanks for, for listening. listening. I think I need a bigger fork. <laughs> <laughs>